Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Taylor and this is my husband Drew. And on this channel, we talk about life and relationships after leaving the church and do commentary on the goings on in evangelical Christianity. As you guys can probably tell, we are actually in a new set. Uh, we moved recently. We're still in Austin, but we just moved somewhere else in Austin. We're still trying to figure out the set design. I might change mine up a little bit as we kind of see what works, but yeah, we're just trying to see how this goes. Yeah. <laughs> so today we are reacting to a video by Vlad and Lana Sovchek. Sov. Let me look at how this last name's pronounced. They're Ukrainian, okay. so I don't really know. Uh, yeah, Sovchuk. I'll go with your <laughs> I <don't know>. different <laughs> pronunciations. It's any of those? S a v c h u k. So maybe somebody that's Ukrainian can tell us yeah. how to pronounce that. Um, but Vlad is the pastor at an Assemblies of God church called Hungry Generation. It's in Pasco, Washington. Um, and like I said, he's originally from the Ukraine, but he moved to the U.S. when he was 13 and apparently started a job as a youth pastor at 16. So oh, wow. he's been pastoring quite a while. Yeah. Um, he's also an author and a YouTuber, and his YouTube channel is actually pretty popular. He okay. has over a million subscribers, wow. and he has a lot of videos over a million. And of course, most of his most popular videos are about demons. Demons and sex. Yeah. That's what sells, right? Yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah, exactly. Like, his most popular videos are demons or sex. Okay. Because, um, yeah, of course. Um, the video that we're reacting to today is actually from his wife's channel. So it's from oh. Lana's channel, which is about my size. Okay. So I've seen a lot of his stuff pop up on my recommended. I I mentioned it to you the other day and you're like, oh, yeah, I've seen this guy. Yeah. Um, so and I've seen uh, some footage of his featured in the Believe It or Not podcast. Okay. So he's yeah, he's pretty popular. Um, a lot of his ministry is focused on deliverance. Uh, yeah, so I thought we might as well respond to one of his videos. Taking on a new person. Here. Yeah. The video we're reacting to today, it is titled, What Type of Sex is Allowed in Marriage? Oh, fascinating. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and jump in here. Their video is only about nine minutes, so it's probably going to be a quick one for us because usually our reaction videos are like an hour and a half, yeah. so it should be shorter today. What's okay in a marriage bed? What is not okay? Different positions in sex. People say sex toys, oral sex all of these things what is biblical what is lawful what is okay this is what we wanted to address we're going to highlight four things that are not okay in a marriage bed first scripture that we would like to read is hebrews chapter 13 verse mm -hmm. 4 marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled but fornicators and adulterers god will judge the greek word translated undefiled is mm -hmm. usually used in this exact form four times in the New Testament, and it means uncontaminated mm -hmm. or set apart. There are many sins, but I'm going to share, we're going to share four mm -hmm. things that are not okay. Sexual immorality. I think it's really interesting when Christians frame sexual sin as fundamentally different because it makes you impure. Like it's, it's, it's treated as literally dirty. Like mm -hmm. it, it triggers this uh disgust response yeah in them i mean do i'm not sure if other sins really trigger this kind of disgust response or if people use language like you know defiled or impure or something when they're talking about i don't know like embezzlement or cryptocurrency scams or something like yeah, that right not so much i don't think that they would use those type of words obviously they yeah. would see them as sins but would they use the word defiled yeah. Probably not. And it does seem that with some Christians, sexual sin and homosexuality has like this special category right. where it's like way more obscene, I guess, than other forms of sin. Yeah. I mean, it, it paints it paints a more literal picture of something being gross when you use yeah. something like defile mm -hmm. or impure, right? As compared yeah. to like, that's morally wrong. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like it just has people have a visceral reaction to it. And I yeah. think that's the exact same reason that 
the most popular, a lot of the most popular Christian videos are about sex or are about homosexuality or trans people yeah. or demons because it, it gives us like real visceral reaction to a lot of people. Yeah. Even though they would say that sexual sin is not any worse than like alcoholism. Yeah. It's like, but the way they talk <laughs> about it and the words they use to describe it and how much they time they dedicate and their sermons and their youtube videos to talking about sexual sin does seem to indicate that they think it's on a different level exactly so is having sex with someone other than your spouse yeah. and here are those four things mm -hmm. number one is adultery so it's when you are mm -hmm. having sex with somebody else including yes including spouse swapping it's adultery and it's very common in our it's culture in common mm -hmm. in our culture Mm -hmm. where people switch spouses or swap spouses yes. temporarily to have better experiences. It's So when I was watching through this, because obviously I've watched this before, I wasn't really sure their comment about it being very common in our culture. I wasn't sure if they meant American culture or Ukrainian culture or in their specific church culture. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and, like, I, I, if they're saying that that's common in American culture, I don't really know how common that is. I would not say a majority of people are non-monogamous. Yeah, no. I feel like that's a minority. Although people that engage in, like, wife swapping tend to not call themselves non-monogamous that's true yeah so, they, it's not really like a poly thing yeah. swapping and poly and non-monogamous tend to be you know separate yeah. things swapping actually is kind of like a monogamous thing it almost. is kind of a monogamous and it's a it can be a very um heteronormative heteronormative yeah. and kind of misogynistic yeah it can be not yeah. always right but. so anyways yeah i just wasn't really sure i would be curious what they're referring to it's not biblical yeah. and it's an adultery the second thing that's not okay mm -hmm. in a marriage bed is, is threesomes that? threesomes Three is when threesome. you bring one more person into bed i actually have uh, seen christians justify that and say well jacob had rachel and leah mm -hmm. so he mm -hmm. was married to two women right and therefore it's okay to uh, bring one more person into uh -huh, bed uh -huh, uh -huh. to practice uh, threesomes well you have to understand is that jacob did practice polygamy it's not god's original intent mm -hmm. but jacob did not have sex with rachel and with leah at the same time at the same time threesomes is sexual immorality it is wrong yeah do you know that I yeah mean... yeah first of all do you know that and like also so that makes it okay like yeah. how does that make it better right so can can you have two wives it's just they you can't have sex with both of them at the same time i mean he said that that was not god's original intent which it's like okay why was that the practice of a pretty prominent figure in the bible yeah if that wasn't god's original intent i mean there are there, there are a lot more prominent biblical figures than just this one that were polygamous right? yeah There's yeah a lot, a lot. And they would obviously, I'm assuming that they don't think poly polygamy is okay and it's yeah, not biblical. Right. So why is the fact that he didn't have sex with them at the same time, like, make everything he did okay then? Yeah, because it's wrong. Because <laughs> it's sexually immoral. It's wrong. <laughs> that's that's kind of all you have to say here to to appeal to people in this, in this camp, right? You just say, yeah. you know, broadly, it's biblical you know, or it's not biblical, it's wrong. And people will be like, yeah, totally. Like, you don't yeah, have to really yeah. give a reasoned justification that goes any deeper than I interpret the Bible to say this. Yeah, Therefore, but I, I just don't know how it, people when it sit there and, like, think, do some critical thinking for a second and be like, well, but polygamy is still, according to these people, yeah. is still wrong. So why does that matter? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't understand why people wouldn't, analyze that i don't know 
I think we should give our breakdown of what we find to be right and wrong after I make sure that yeah. we finish with this point. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Even if your spouse agrees mm-hmm. with it, if your spouse spouse agrees with it, they are crazy. <laughs> um, and if you think of that idea, you are also crazy. And if a third person is on board with that, you have three of you are <laughs> crazy. crazy. Yeah, the marriage is supposed to be between two people, yes. not a whole neighborhood. It's a small neighborhood. Let's yeah, let's address what we agree with and what we don't. Obviously, I don't think that adultery is a good thing. And how do we define adultery? I would define adultery as you going off on your own without talking to your spouse, without having their consent, right. going off and doing things whether it it doesn't even have to be sexual it can be like a romantic thing if you guys haven't talked about that that's what i would call adultery yeah if it's consensual like threesomes that's not adultery but it is crazy it is crazy (laughs) it's like there again i mean he just says you're crazy okay great point man like in this i mean i saw this video has like what six hundred thousand something views yeah it has a lot all you have to say to appeal to this crowd crazy. is you're, you're just crazy. You're, crazy. you're just crazy. That's it. And what if you have foursomes? What does that make you like certifiably insane? It makes you <laughs> it makes you biblical. That's <laughs> what, what it probably makes you. I mean, uh, I, I don't even know what the term would be for what Solomon was doing. I mean, like. Yeah. What if you have a whole harem? Yeah. A whole harem <laughs> all at once. I mean, Esther also was a part of a, a harem. Admittedly, you know, Xerxes was not a Christian, but still. I mean, I, and I also think that that is just really harmful to accuse people who are non-monogamous or monogamish or are interested in threesomes, accusing them of being crazy. Yeah. Like that is just very very harmful they're not crazy some people that's their thing and if they want to do that and everybody involved is consenting to it then there's absolutely no problem with it you're not crazy for wanting to do that he's just lazily throwing stigma at yeah at people that's all it is i mean it's it's really more about defining group boundaries like we're good people you're bad people Yeah, it's more so that than actually like laying out a reasoned case for why this is wrong. Like, I don't think that someone's a bad person if they are monogamous and like would never, ever, ever want to do something other than monogamy. Or even if they think that like that's wild that anyone would do anything other than monogamy, that's fine. I don't think those people. Yeah, you can think that it's not for you. Yeah, but you can't tell other people what they have to do in their relationships and sex life. But I, I just think that the, it makes a lot more sense to base this in consent. Yeah. You know, like, are, is it doing harm? Are people okay with it or not? And you come to an agreement from there. Yeah. If, it, if it's working for you, it's working for you. Yeah. Like, I don't, it, I think you get further from understanding harm and recognizing what good and bad outcomes are and making decisions that help you get there when you have, like, Uh, an infinitely interpretable book as your moral standard rather than actually being willing to examine the problem more in depth right yeah or just yeah looking at what are the outcomes of this are is there any like quantifiable harm that has come from these actions rather than being like i'm gonna go principle based and just look at this book and see what the book says and live my life dictated by a book yeah I i think it's a lot healthier to look at it from a lens of like is this harmful or not yeah but that's it's hard to do it's like a lot of work a lot of thinking i mean non-monogamy is a lot of work and a lot of communication if you talk to anybody who does that like it's a lot of work and communication yeah and that is true that is very true of non-monogamy i think that there are some people that start in non-monogamy and they don't truly understand that it is more work they just think that like, oh, it's the same thing as monogamy. It's just with more people. Yeah. And it's like, it's doable, of course, but there is a lot more communication and work that you have to put into it just because there are more people involved in the situation. Yeah. And I feel like just, yeah, some people 
don't really do the work of like educating themselves on the subject before they delve into that. And I think that's specifically true in the atheist community because there are so many people that came from like fundamentalist Mm -hmm. forms of Christianity that are deconverting or deconstructing. And they kind of see like, oh, I was restricted so long it to, and I was restricted from having all these sexual experiences. Now I want to have all of them. Yeah. And it's like one step at a time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, learn and educate yourself first. Right. It's this like the same thing with mind altering substances. Like if you were taught uh, any amount of alcohol or weed is so horrible and bad and you're going to be possessed if you do it. And then you find out that like, no, you're not going to be possessed if you do it. Then people are like, oh, I can just drink and smoke as much as I want. And it's like. No, <laughs> they yeah, can't do that yeah. either. The answer is actually a lot more complicated yeah. than either way. Right. Now, the third uh, thing that's not okay in marriage mm-hmm. is... Mm-hmm. Is watching porn, pornography. Watching porn with your spouse is a virtual threesome and virtual idolatry. Adultery. Adultery. Mm-hmm. Now, I have um, mentored or prayed for some couples who one spouse came and said, we want to introduce marriage into our marriage pornography so where usually it's a husband mm-hmm. who um, forces a wife to watch pornography and then to, then to reenact that mm-hmm. in their marriage bed it's wrong it's a sin and it's an open yes. door to demons and so watching porn to spice up your uh, marriage bed is you're inviting demons into your marriage bed. You're you're inviting fantasies. It's not real. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have I have an interview with an ex porn star. Yeah. You can watch it. And this is not this is not how real sex is. It's it's a perf- these are called performers. These are not spouses. Okay. And so and it takes you know days uh, to make a forty minute yeah. video. And there's a lot of editing that's that's involved there. It's it, it's it's not. It's not how really, marriage yeah. is. It's made. It's made for entertainment, godless entertainment. But it's not made to be an example. Mm-hmm. And so, and if you take that as an example for your marriage, you just, it's pretty much a sure way to destroy your marriage. It's literally trying to fix a porn problem by reenacting mm-hmm. pornography mm-hmm. in marriage. But it's mm-hmm. wrong. The th- There's a lot to address yeah. in that one. So first of all, I don't think that introducing pornography to your marriage is necessarily a bad thing as long as you're educated and know what it is that you're getting involved with yeah i i do think he has a point though when he's talking about it being a performance and that if you're trying to reenact pornography with your spouse and you have this expectation at least this is what i'm taking yeah this is what i'm understanding from what he's saying is that if you have this expectation that your sex is going to look exactly like pornography then that is not a very good idea yeah that's not healthy yeah i think that that is a valid point because pornography it is a performance and he is correct people spend days shooting porn it's entertainment yeah And even the models have so much that they do in order to prepare for shoots like that. And they might have uh, things that have been done to their body to look more stereotypically appealing to people. So it doesn't present a realistic expectation or realistic presentation of sex. But if you understand that and you understand that it is a fantasy, it's not realistic but it's something that you and your partner still want to enjoy, there's not a problem with that. Yeah. As long as you're even, I think even seeing something in porn, like maybe a certain sex position and you're like, Oh, I really want to try that with us. That I think there's no problem with that. I'm not sure if I would call that like reenacting. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like with the, with the last thing there's, there's different levels to this. And honestly, just figuring this kind of thing out is more complicated than it's, good or it's bad yeah i mean you can you can watch even you can watch and just by watching porn support a horrible corporation exploitation of people yeah um people being filmed without their consent all of these things and just watching the porn can do something that brings about bad outcomes for people can be wrong in this utilitarian way that we talk about but you can also watch porn that does not do that 
And then if you have the understanding of what this is, like you talked about, as long as it's consensual, if it is the husband forcing the wife to watch it, whatever it is. Yeah. That's Yeah, you shouldn't. If somebody doesn't want to watch porn, like if one person involved doesn't want to watch porn, then obviously, yeah. Yeah, just that makes it a problem. Just that brings about a bad outcome. But if people are consenting, if you are using material that is actually ethically made yeah. and source people aren't being exploited or or whatever um and everyone understands what it is that they're watching yeah then yeah. i think that you can again i think that an answer like ours is maybe more difficult to get across to a really big popular audience because we will give all this explanation and say it can be done right and it can be done wrong yeah. it's just complicated and you're going to have to figure it out whereas they can be like it's bad and there's going to be demons who do things to you when you sleep if you like it's they can use fear tactics and extremely simple answers and we just aren't willing to do that that is an interesting point although i will say and i think maybe the next thing they're going to talk about they do say that there's nuance in this area Mm. and that you have to kind of use your best judgment and it's like a case-by-case scenario so it's like they are doing that with what they're talking about right now but other stuff then they kind of understand that there's complexity okay um and you'll see that another thing that i thought was interesting is that he seems to think that or he says that you shouldn't be bringing in fantasy to your sex life which i'm not exactly sure what he means by that yeah if he means like fantasy as an unrealistic i I don't know exactly what he means but i mean in my opinion, I think that fantasy can be a really integral part of your sex life and it doesn't have to be a negative thing. Again, yeah. as long as you understand that it's a fantasy. Right. Like people are going to fantasize about stuff when they're engaging in sex and when they're, you know, on their own. Yeah. That's just human nature to do that for most people. It... Obviously, there's asexual people who might not experience that. Sure. But... I don't know how you separate sex from fantasy. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, I think that when people are just getting aroused to the point where they want to have sex, there is some kind of imagination going on yeah. beforehand. Like, yeah, speaking from my own experience, I'm not usually going in being like, I haven't even thought about this. Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And like, I mean, even in their confines of what they consider permissible sex one man and one woman you might want to explore and like have fantasies about different scenarios or yeah. like role play can you fantasize That's about fantasy. each other can you fantasize about like y- you know the one man and one woman you and your wife whatever like doing what you want and then tell your spouse about this fantasy and then go from there i mean I is don't that know. allowed I don't know. I don't know if he's just not using that word correctly or if that's actually what he thinks. Yeah, I don't know. I, in one way, I I would like to get clarification, but I also am not completely sure if I have the most productive conversation with this guy, yeah. given that he's willing to invoke like demons and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's another thing we should probably talk yeah. about. Yeah. So obviously, <laughs> watching porn, you're not inviting demons. You're not going to become demonically possessed oh, because can you, you watch pornography. Can you pornography. prove that? Can you prove that? You can't. Can you, can you disprove that demons exist? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> well, can't then why are you making negative. this point? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's where people always go. It's like, well, can you disprove it? Like, no, I mean, because you can't like disprove that like invisible leprechauns are yeah. also involved with your porn watching. But one of the reasons that people like this will like start talking about demons is because that is the go-to like scary thing. I'm trying to scare you into not doing this is yeah. to say you're going to be demonically possessed because that's can you really imagine anything more scary than that yeah. like maybe hell itself yeah but like demons is the scariest thing so like that's just a go-to there's not just monsters under your bed there's gonna be monsters in your bed if you do this. <laughs> fourth, fourth one. wrong thing in a marriage bed is rape mm-hmm. all non-consexual sex consensual consensual sex is rape whether in marriage or not 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I, I mainly paused it to say that, unfortunately, while I know Christians in real life, that would be like, yeah, 100%. Mm. Like most of the Christians that I know, probably all yeah. the Christians I know would be like, yes. I've never actually heard anyone ever say that in like popular Christian content before. Usually it's like, well, yeah. can you really, can you really raise a spouse? You yeah, know? yeah. I, I do want to give kudos to them for including that and yeah. for being so matter of fact about yeah. it and just like, no, this is a hard line in the sand. You cannot do this in marriage or not. Yeah. I, I would say that that would probably be like my first point. Like, <laughs> that would be like the first thing I say. Yeah. But the they fact still got that to they, it. yeah, included it at all is really good it's good i do wonder if they're going to base their issue with this their condemnation of this in the same thing as us we'd be like that brings about terrible outcomes i think there's harm involved i'm not sure if they expand upon this how much they do expand upon this but i'm assuming it's because they have some biblical backing for it we'll see now mentioned first Mm -hmm. corinthians chapter 7 verses 1 through 5 deals with giving satisfaction in sex Mm -hmm. not demanding it or forcing a spouse yes to have sex with you the bible does not give that permission Mm -hmm. to demand sex yeah now when it comes to things like so okay. yeah, they yeah. Uh, ground that in the Bible, not in actual harm that can come from rape. Yeah, which I mean, it's like I'm I'm glad that ultimately the condemnation is there, but I do wish that it was maybe thought through a little bit yeah. more. I have to ask you though, um, have you seen people? prop up verses in the Bible that imply that you can and maybe even should demand sex from your partner. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, we've, I think we've reacted we to have. videos where people say that kind of thing and they have a biblical backing. There's a specific verse that people bring up and they're actually going to bring up that verse. We'll talk about it. Oh, we'll, yeah, we'll talk great. about it. Okay. Different positions in sex. People say sex toys, oral sex, all of these things. What is biblical? What is lawful? What is okay? This is what we wanted to address. We want to pretty much give you three questions to ask before. If it's not yeah. adultery, mm-hmm. if it's not adultery, if it's not bringing another person or bringing a pornography mm-hmm. or it's not where you're forcing somebody yeah. what about some other sexual expressions in bed and so we want to ask you to ask three questions if you're thinking well should we can we three questions to ask question number one is it prohibited in the scripture mm-hmm. if it's not assume it's permitted if it's not prohibited in the mm-hmm. scripture and it's between you and your spouse mm-hmm. um, you can assume in a married bed it is permitted. So that's kind of what I was referring to and like the specific circumstance of in marriage, then they're allow for some nuance and for some yeah. gray. I, I, I'm sorry, but the, the, the trump card is always, guess what is not prohibited in scripture? even specifically by Jesus, slavery. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot worse than, yeah. Yeah, that's slavery. true. Yeah, that's that's really true. And there are there are sex slaves in the Bible. Yeah. That's what a concubine is. That is very true. And, I mean, I imagine, well, not I imagine, I know that they would say that's wrong. They obviously yeah. would say that's wrong. So I'm not saying that they're saying that that's right. But I don't know that this first question really prohibits something like that. I don't think we should assume that, like, sex slavery might be all right because it's featured in the Bible, not, like, condemned in the Bible. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure that they would respond with that that was the culture of the time and God was just operating within 
that culture to make it the most humane as possible. Yeah. But it's like, okay, for so for why why for this specific thing, slavery, do you say like, oh well, it's cultural. But then for other things, like homosexuality, which is what I thought you were gonna say, yeah. which actually we've talked about this before in the Bible, there's only like six verses that talk about homosexuality and each one is not really talking about homosexuality and the way we understand it today. Yeah. But why with something like that is it suddenly not cultural? Yeah. Like suddenly it's applicable to modern time. Right. I don't get that. So if it's not adultery, if you're not bringing some sexual fantasies um, into a marriage bed, if you're not forcing your spouse, and if you're not bringing somebody else, you can assume it's pretty much permitted. First Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 6, verse 12. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So, Paul is pretty much saying that, okay, mm -hmm. things are lawful for yeah. me. Is it lawful? Mm -hmm. So, that's what the first question we ask. Yeah, yeah, is yeah. the Bible mm -hmm. against it? Is the Bible very clearly against it? Mm -hmm. If the Bible is not in the area of marital sexual intimacy mm -hmm. we have freedom now the second question we want to ask and that is this is this beneficial mm -hmm. does it harm or hinder sexual uh, closeness between two spouses there we go so does this act does this uh, particular behavior mm -hmm. will it bring us closer mm -hmm. or will it actually pull us further away that's a good one. And yeah. that's what Paul says, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Yeah. He says, all things are lawful, but he says, not all things are helpful. helpful. Yes. So, okay, what does the Bible say? Is the Bible clearly against it? If not, we are within our Christian freedom. Mm -hmm. But then we have to ask another question. Not just are we free to do it, but should we do it mm -hmm. based on this? Based on this? Mm -hmm. Is this going to help our intimacy or harm? Our intimacy. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is a great point. I feel like that's a great thing to be asking. Yeah. Um, obviously, I wish that he they didn't lead with, well, is it in the Bible? And then go, is it helpful? Like, yeah. you should be asking, is it helpful or is it harmful? But right. at least they're grounding something in, like, quantifiable harm. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's something there, which is... Uh, that's the biggest step beyond any other Christian video on sex that we have ever reacted yeah. to, I have to say. Yeah, I think it is. And usually one spouse suggests maybe something and the other one will say, you know what, I don't feel comfortable. I feel da 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 da, -da yeah. and stuff. So, And then what, what that begins to happen mm -hmm. is that then this helps you to know if this yeah. is helping. Yeah, and, and if one spouse may say, oh, it's going to help me in our intimacy. And another spouse will say, oh, it's not going to help me for sure. That means it's not going to be helpful for the marriage, for the marriage itself. And this mm -hmm. is where we are shooting at for yeah. both people to come closer, not just for one person to feel like, oh, yeah, it's going to help me. I'm really glad to see that because you notice that they're not using gendered language when they're talking about this. Yeah. I've yeah. actually never seen that in a Christian video yeah. about sex before. They're just saying spouse, like, because we, like, the what's the most common thing that we're reacting to when we're talking about, um, you know, can a person demand sex? Like, what what is the imbalance that we are often pointing out there? Um, usually it's, can the husband demand sex because he's, like, the leader? Yeah. Yeah, and this is not saying anything about, you know, gender roles or anything like that, which when you're talking about actual outcomes, you don't just go, well, is this, does this fit within the role? Yeah. It's like, no, does this harm either person regardless of their role? Yeah. I do wonder if there's some cognitive dissonance or how they fit together these kind of two different ways of thinking because... It's almost like for certain things, they're thinking principle-based, and then for other things, they're thinking outcomes-based. Yeah. So I wonder, and they acknowledge that that's a thing, yeah. that like these things are wrong because they cause harm. Yeah. I wonder how they would fit something that is prohibited in the Bible, but 
we can see that no harm comes from it. Oh, yeah. How would they fit that within their model of reality? Because it seems like they're upholding these two different ways of thinking yeah. that don't actually go together. I imagine that they would say if it's prohibited in the Bible, but it's not harmful in an observable way, then it's st it's still bad. Like, you know, it has spiritual harm. But what if we took it a step further and we're like, this is obviously actually making your intimacy better. Mm. You know, yeah. like, like what if you both grew up in a particularly oppressive environment where there's a lot of taboos around sex and you want to be able to do something that you both agree is in line with the Bible and bringing in, like actually watching people do it for even a limited amount of time. Like, just just look at some of these pictures so we can get this down. Yeah. You know, would would that be okay? Because that probably would help your intimacy. We've yeah. we've talked to people who, you know, were raised in like Christian fundamentalist environments and not like watching Bang Bros or something, but watching porn that's reasonable for a reasonable amount of time just to see, like, to break the taboo. Yeah. Like that did help them. So what if we have a benefit, but it's prohibited? You know, good outcome, but it's prohibited by the Bible. Is that Yeah, I don't okay? know how they would fit that yeah. into their way of thinking about things. I, I wonder, too, for people that monogamy just really doesn't work for them. And, like, psychologically, they're just more, they lean more towards being polyamorous and, like, so does their partners if you, we can demonstrate them having multiple partners has a health or mental health benefit and it does for all partners versus being monogamous, what would they say to that? Yeah. You know, I, I just, yeah, again, I just don't really know how it's like they're on the right track, but then there's yeah. like adding this layer that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. I think the most obvious one, I don't know why neither one of us thought of it until now, homosexuality. Like what if you're, what if you're gay and you want to just get married to your partner yeah you can demonstrate that that has a benefit yeah and that's probably pretty easily demonstrable oh yeah i think so and uh, that would that would be serious conflict it'd be interesting to see how they resolve that i wonder if um demons would be brought into that <laughs> equation yeah. and then third one and that's the biggest one mm -hmm. and is there a mutual consent, consent? Mm -hmm. so what does the bible say is it lawful is it beneficial and thirdly is there a mutual consent? Is the spouse being forced, coerced into what he or she is not comfortable with? Mm -hmm. Or manipulated to. <laughs> or manipulated into. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter mm -hmm. 7, verse 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves uh, to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because you lack self-control. Yeah, so we see pretty much here that the Bible says that there needs to be consent. Yeah. E okay. Then <laughs> that, I guess, let me play it just a little bit longer. Even to withdraw sexually, mm -hmm. there must be consent. Mm -hmm. And so that means that God wants us to have a mutual consent. God wants us to have, yes. is it scriptural? Mm -hmm. Is it beneficial? And is there mutual consent? So that it, it's really interesting that in the bible there's this emphasis on consent when it's about whether or not you both might take some time off from having sex it's like suddenly now you need both to agree to it mm -hmm. and there's no discussion on consent to have sex right, right. and this particular situation where you're not having sex is the one time where you don't need mutual consent. Yeah. You only need one person. You don't need, a, you only need one person to say, Hey, I don't want to have sex. You don't need the other person to agree to that. Yeah. So it's like the example they gave is like the one example, I guess, of like consent that is harmful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like completely backward. Yeah. So the three things I talked about when deciding whether or not you should do something sexually with your partner is what does it say in the bible does the bible prohibit it is it helpful and is there mutual consent there are some good parts in there mm -hmm. i would lead with your number one 
point should probably, like, number one thing to consider should be consent. Yeah. Number two, yeah, is it beneficial or is it harmful or maybe it's just neutral, which yeah. neutral is probably fine. Get Do away with the Bible stuff because every example that they, every verse that they brought up in the Bible is like something that was really unhealthy and that you actually should not do. Yeah. And I find it really interesting because it seems like they're really on a good track. Like the ideas that they come up with on their own without referencing the Bible yeah. are like perfect. Yeah, like great. amazing. But then whenever they bring up the Bible, it's like, oof, you really, really you should not do mark. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like their thinking about morality is um, a lot higher and better than the Bibles. Yeah. I found it really interesting that they brought up the verse that they did about consent. And they they took that to mean, you know, you should have consent to have sex. I have seen that verse exclusively brought up to say yeah. specifically, actually, wives, your husband can ask for sex pretty much whenever uh, a woman actually owes it to the man and the man owes it to the woman. Of course, we know that that's not like really? as, as relevant yeah. of a problem. But the fact that they can interpret this to be saying primarily consent is really important. We have to get consent. And other people have historically interpreted the yeah. same exact verse to say, oh, actually, um, your your spouse owns your body so they can mm. do what they want with it. I think that presents the true harm of bringing in the Bible into your ethics. And it's not because it has something to do with a God. It's not because it has something to do with religion. It's because it is infinitely interpretable. Right. People will bring in their own priors, their own biases, and make it say what they want to say. Yeah. I think that if you're looking at the actual empirical evidence of what is harmful and what's not harmful, and the just observing whether or not someone consents or not, you can get a much clearer picture of what's right and right. wrong than if you bring in this infinitely interpretable, interpretable ancient book. Yeah, and I mean, I think that it's totally okay if you come up with your own moral framework and what you decide is right and wrong. And then if there's particular parts of the Bible or verses that you want to attach to that because you find it personally fulfilling, I think that's fine. But that's starting from this is what I find morally right and good. And this is what society says is morally right and good. And I'm just backing it up then with some scripture. I don't see the harm in that. If, if, if you find that it helps you emotionally. I think that you can you can take, you know, morals and ethics and things from the Bible, even thinking that this is divine in some way. I've interviewed people on my channel who do see the Bible as from God or it, it leads to God, it points to God. And I don't think that I see any real problem with what they're doing. The the problem really arises when you uncritically accept something right you know yeah. when when you interpret the passage to say this and you go okay that's it hands down this is exactly what's yeah. right and wrong you can't question that if you go i think that this comes from god but i also have to engage with this and understand and that about it. this is yeah i have to think about this i have to realize that i'm bringing my own cultural lens yeah. i have to realize the writer brought their own cultural lens that this can be interpreted many different ways. If you still think it's divine, but you can do all of those things, I don't see a problem with bringing in this religious element into understanding right. your morality. Yeah. I think it can actually be a very beneficial thing. I think yeah. I get a lot of good things from the Bible personally. Yeah. But and I, I think just to use an example, there's things from like the Satanic Temple Seven Tenets that I like attach to my own morality. But I do so because I've thought about it and because it lines up with yeah. my, like, moral framework. Not because, oh, the satanic temple says this and they are the authority on yeah. morality. And even, like, I think the last tenant of, like, TST Seven Tenants talks about how all of these tenants are, like, subject. I can't remember the exact wording, but, like, something, like subject to change or yeah. um, and the, this, need to be thought about critically. The spirit of justice should always triumph over, over the written, the written word. word. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, I think attaching it, if you find it personally fulfilling, isn't a problem. But when you're like, 
upholding it as like this unchangeable authority that is giving you these rules from high above like then that's a problem yeah so that was the end of the video um my final thoughts on on it are yeah i think that they had several good points there um i'm so glad that they emphasized consent because when christian a lot of conservative christian youtubers talk about sex that's like not something ever mentioned yeah and i'm like so happy that that was like a big thing that they drove home i just wish it would have been like earlier on more more prominently featured yeah more prominently featured but yeah they had some good things in there but yeah like i said before it's like there's some good things but then they had this like layer of toxicity (laughs) that doesn't need to be there in place of our typical what did we learn at the end i'm just gonna ask you one question would you like to go commit virtual adultery with me? <laughs> Let's go watch some porn and get demonically possessed. <laughs> we should put that put that on a on a t shirt. Let's go watch porn and get demonically possessed. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. And a quick note before I sign off, let us know what you think of our new sets. Um, We're still kind of in the process of getting them where we need them to be. So if you guys have any ideas of like what you think would look good, please let us know because yeah, it's kind of weird. Like it looks really like this room is huge on camera, but it's actually, it's actually a really, really small, small room. It's smaller than any room we've ever recorded. <laughs> yeah, in. it's very tiny. A big thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my Instagram is Taylor underscore the underscore antibot. And if you'd like to contribute to this channel financially, a link to my Patreon will be down in the description and we'll see you on the next one. Say bye.